Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Asia Pacific Online Distance Education Week. Um, so it is um, a co-joint event by the Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia, OTLA, and the Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand, um, FLANS, in, con in association with the International Council for Open and Distance Education, ICDE. And hence, um, the first presenter for the week is um, Torun. Um, so Torun is the Secretary General of ICDE, a global membership association and not-for-profit NGO hosted by Norway. Um, so she has more than 20 years of experience in open, flexible distance and online education. So it's very exciting to have her um, with us um, to start this um, airport week. Um, so this is a discussion session uh, as far as I understand. So uh, feel free to um, ask questions in the chat or unmute your mic um, to interact with Torun. So um, again, thank you very much Torun for joining us here. Um, and I think most of us are from New Zealand and Australia uh, looking at the list of the audience. So thank you again for your time and uh, over to you Torun. Thanks, Nui. No. And thank you very much to, to both Odla and Flans for inv inviting me. So as Nui no, said, uh, I'm Torin. Uh, I'm the Secretary General of ICD since uh, January 2020. It's a pleasure to be here with you this very early morning from Oslo, Norway, where it's completely dark outside because we're approaching the winter season. Uh, it's, it's really rainy and wet, but it's a pleasure to start my week uh, together with you. Um, so to Today, I will give you um, a short introduction to, to ICDE and an outline why advocacy for open, flexible and distance learning is a vital part of ICDE's work. Uh, I will also give you some examples on how ICDE as a membership association aims to support and empower our members um, to advocate within their regional and strategically focused context through dedicated task forces. But first, uh, maybe uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, so um, we are, ICD is very old. I think the, the, the oldest membership association in our field of distance and online education it was founded back in Canada uh, in 1938, actually. Uh, and the reason why the Secretariat is based in um, Norway is that uh, we have been funded, um, partly funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research uh, since uh, 1988. And uh, we are in a formal consultative uh, partnership with UNESCO that's also been ongoing for a long time since the 1960s. And our vision is to achieve the potential of open, flexible and distance learning created through our members and learning communities. Because we are a very small association with a big outreach. We have members, more than 230 members and partners in all the world regions, as seen on the map here in more than 70 countries. And together, these members are impacting over 15 million students across all the continents. Here you see our strategic priorities uh, from the strategic plan of ICDE from 21 to 24. And as you can see, the, the strategic objective number one is to advocate globally for open, flexible and distance learning and enable regional and national influence through members and partners. And this strategic priority was made by the ICDE board in the last part of 2020. So obviously also very related to the COVID-19 pandemic and the massive impact that it had on the whole education system globally. What we saw during COVID was um, on the positive side, um, obviously that many uh, educators, teachers, faculty, and also students worldwide took a very giant leap in developing um, open flexible distance learning provisions in a very short time because the only way that education could continue, continue was with, with online and distance education. On the other hand, on the negative side, we saw um, many examples of uh, low quality, uh, so-called emergency remote teaching, 
due to the uh, natural unpreparedness um, that many educators were struggling because they weren't prepared. They didn't have maybe the necessary infrastructure or um, competencies within the leadership or faculty teachers. Um, and we also saw a negative impact on students' mental health and well-being because many of them were isolating and trying to study under very difficult circumstances. They also um, experienced very high bandwidth costs, many students in many parts of the world, and a very difficult uh, home situation for many learners. So among ICDE's members, we have many experienced providers uh, of quality open flexible distance learning who have been doing this for decades. And they look to ICDE as the global membership association for open flexible distance learning to advocate globally for what is quality education through the various ways of online and distant provision and what it in return requires of investment, uh, support, infrastructure, regulations, et cetera, within their local context. And not the least, it was important to ICD's members to connect the global advocacy of open flexible and distance learning to a greater societal value linking open and distance education to the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda as a transformative power in itself. So this is why we created the ICDE Global Advocacy Campaign, by empowering our members to act locally within a global advocacy framework, we aim to change the negative narrative of online and distance education that was fueled by the pandemic. And we did this uh, through a joint exercise uh, where presidents and rectors of ICDE member universities collectively developed advocacy messages. And through them, showing relevance, urgency, and proof of concept of what works, advocating for quality, open, flexible, and distance learning as a prerequisite for equitable and equal access to quality education and lifelong learning opportunities for all as per the sustainable development goal number four. So as seen on, on this slide, <clears throat> we initiated regional and um, topical task forces led by ICT institutional members. And the goal is to extend um, these regional task forces to all the world regions. You see some of them are, are still missing here, but we started uh, with a few in Asia, in Oceania, in Latin America, and within the Nordic countries. Um, and then we also have uh, a few specific, specific topical campaigns. So um, um, together with the members, we, we, we launched um, all these campaigns during uh, 22. Um, the, the topical campaigns, it's uh, the first one of OER is led by um, an expert committee uh, called the ICD OER Advocacy Committee. They're already advocating for OER, so they're focusing on this. Um, and, uh, and the um, ethics campaign is led by another member, who, which also is a global association called Globethics.net, and it focuses on ethics uh, in education. So I'll come back to a couple of these task forces in a minute um, to give you a, a little bit more uh, details um, on the examples. Uh, but first, let me introduce the, the advocacy toolkit, which uh, has been uh, developed by ICDE. Uh, this toolkit is um, everything of this material is, is on this uh, web page, um, this campaign website on the ICDE.org uh, website. Um, and the toolkit consists of, um, of various materials, uh, which are, are all openly licensed and available to anyone to use. So it can be adapted, shared, or reused. Um, and it includes a document with advocacy messages. These are the messages that was collaboratively developed by ICDE members, presidents, rectors, vice chancellors of ICD institutional members. And it's also a document, um, a leaflet with uh, a step-by-step -step guide on how to build and run an advocacy campaign. So it consists of um, an advocacy checklist, uh, an action framework, how to target your audience, how to map your stakeholders, and so on. 
here you see uh, some thumbnails illustrating these two documents. So on the on the left side, you have the advocacy messages. Um, and on the right hand side, it's the leaflet with the step by step guide. Um, the messages is more on what we want to change. So suggestions for messages, while um, the step by step guide, the leaflet is a how to guide. And as a part of this toolkit, we also uh, developed um, a PowerPoint template, uh, a banner, and some social media cards. And the idea is that uh, one can build uh, and run campaigns, reuse messages, develop them, translate them, uh, and then use this, this framework and these templates for, for advocacy. So as mentioned, while the task forces are run by ICD members, um, all these materials are available to anyone uh, for, for free and it can be adapted and shared and reused. So these are some of the examples of the messages that were developed by the ICD executive leaders. As you can see, they are targeted towards various types of audiences, trying to build on what is important to them. Because advocacy can be done on many different levels. Um, maybe there's a need to advocate within your institution. Maybe the stakeholders you would need to convince is, um, you know, your leadership uh, with the institution or um, the faculty or teachers, or it could be um, messages targeting policymakers, leaders. So um, the members have tried in this um, toolkit to develop messages targeting various stakeholders. And you see some highlighted examples there. The idea is that a task force, which is locally built, can ex extend and build and reuse these messages so that their purpose, um, so that they become even more targeted uh, for their purpose within their local context. So obviously translation to a local language is core. Uh, and also as, as well as identification of the relevant stakeholders, who you're trying to reach, and what do they care about. <clears throat> Here is the example of one of the top topical task forces, the one on ethics in education. It was initiated by uh, our members Globeethics.net, uh, headquarters in Geneva in Switzerland, um, but they also have members uh, in all parts of the world. Their idea was to develop targeted messages on ethics in education through um, specially designed postcards and letters that were distributed and made available to their community on the occasion of their annual conference um, and the Global Ethics Day uh, recently on 19th October. So they named the campaign the Living Letters Campaign. And you see the postcard, uh, an example of the postcard uh, here on these slides. Uh, with targeted hashtags uh, and the co-branding with ICDE and globeethics.net. So they suggested messages, one message each postcard. And the idea was that um, their members can use these postcards or letters and actually address them to the ones they're trying to influence. So this is exactly uh, what ICDE as a member association is aiming for. It is to empower our members to advocate within their local or strategically specific context by using the advocacy toolkit as a starting point. Through this campaign, Globethics.net aims to mobilize their members and networks in order to influence relevant stakeholders and decision makers related to education, to the education field in, in all the parts of the world through these targeted messages, highlighting the importance of ethics and values as an integral part of higher education. And here's a picture from the launch event. Um, sorry, it's it's low quality, but you see uh, the number of people engaging, all the postcards distributed on the tables. Um, and this is from the, the launch event on the Globe Ethics Day in, in Geneva on the 19th of October. Here's another example. This is from the Asia Task Force. <clears throat> this regional task force is, um, is led by two Asian institutional members, the Asia University and the University of the Philippines Open University. 
obviously Asia is a very, very large region, uh, but it helps having two dedicated leaders uh, as co-chairing co this task force. So that is, I think, why um, it was successful from the beginning um, through the dedication of the highest leadership level with Professor Dr. Ansari Ahmed, the CEO of Asia E University, and Dr. Melinda Bandalaria, who also is a board member of ICD. She's the chancellor of UPOU. So these two members have managed to mobilize over 40 individuals among ICD members across 10 to 12 different Asian countries already in just a few months. So this task force is, is organized into five different working groups with these 40 individuals. And they're each focusing on different areas that the task force chose to focus on. So one working group works on policy, uh, mapping of policies within the, the different countries in the Asia region. What are the challenges? Uh, where, are, where is the potential? Another uh, group works on capacity building. And there's one uh, working on sharing uh, best practices and resources. And one working group is working on a platform, which is the web page that you see here. Um, so they have a, their own uh, website with uh, information about the Asia Task Force. And here they also publish um, the, the output, the, the, the resources that they adapt and develop. And there's also one um, working group focusing on future collaboration. And here's a picture from the launch event for the Asia task force. It took place during the high level roundtable for vice chancellors and uh, vice chancellors of open and flexible distance learning institutions. It was organized by the Commonwealth of Learning and Asia University in Malaysia in July this year. And the last examples I, that I'm going to give you is from this um, the OER task force, which is led by the ICD OER Advocacy Committee, with Dr. Ebasia Nilsson, who also is a board member of ICD. She is chairing that committee. It consists of, of 12 global ambassadors uh, for OER from all the world regions, and they're appointed among the ICD members. So the OER Advocacy Committee, they have developed 11 new um, advocacy messages which are the ones you see on the right-hand side on the slide. Um, so messages focusing on OER and open education and openness in education. Um, and these ambassadors have made an outstanding contribution in translating these messages. So not only develop, they developed 11 new messages, they've also been translated already to various languages. And they now started to translate other uh, toolkit materials, such as the original messages document and the step-by-step -step guide into different languages. So now I, I would really like to hear from you, uh, from what you have heard so far. Um, how, how do you see the relevance for advocating for open flexible distance learning in the Oceania region? Um, because that is also a huge region with long distances. And uh, we have uh, some engaged members here today. Uh, we have uh, one member institution um, in Fiji, um, the University of South uh, Pacific, who already um, volunteered to, to work with the task force. And we have uh, the regional associations, Odla and Flans. Um, we have started discussing with them also how uh, we can work together, how ICD can support you in, in joining forces for a regional task force. So we would, I would very much like to hear from you, um, what role could this association uh, play in this work? And how do you see uh, the relevance uh, specifically? Uh, are there any specific challenges or specific messages or ideas uh, to building this task force um, that you see already? So that was really um, the slides that I had prepared. I, I just also wanted to to say obviously that uh, we would welcome more members to um, to ICDE. Uh, I hope that that this introduction and the discussions we will have now um, will inspire you to engage um, with uh, the ICD OER advocacy campaign um, by joining, maybe you will join one of our task forces or initiated even new ones. 
So if you're not already a member, uh, please reach out to us at icd at icd.org or to me directly. And uh, we welcome uh, many more members, uh, which can bring um, expertise and diversity to our association. It will only make our collective voice stronger uh, for the global advocacy for quality, inclusive and accessible education. So we can share this uh, presentation uh, later, but now back to um, my questions to you. Um, from what you've heard, um, what is most relevant to you and, and how can we work together um, in the region? So I'll, I'll stop sharing here and um, hope that there's some questions. Yeah, and um, Jay has his hand up. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Toyan. Uh, look, a, a massive opportunity for us here because I, you know, in my time at Odla, uh, so coming on for four years, we haven't done anywhere near enough work in this space and we certainly haven't done enough work with our colleagues in Flans um, and then more broadly uh, across the Asia Pacific region. So um, whilst we've been very good at uh, servicing our own members particularly well and advocating for new members, we haven't asked our members to advocate on behalf of uh, open and flexible education anywhere near like we should. Um, so the postcards is one great example, but there are so many things. We've the, the, the coming together much more of Flans and Odla as a starting point to leverage the opportunities that we have in that partnership and to work with ICDE to really launch something here. Something that probably is uh, a little more unique to our region, but of course leveraging off the work you've done. So I, I'm not really saying anything, but I'm being an advocate of the advocacy campaign, saying that it's a real opportunity for us. And uh, yeah, and you know, as I said to Ram when, when we caught up recently, uh, for us is to run this session now and then present something more broadly or to think about a strategy around how we're going to do this in the new year. Uh, both at Bodler and Flans Executive would be uh, really great. Thank you. Is there anyone else um, have any thoughts? Simon? Yes, Simon. Um, thank you. Um, I, I don't. I don't want. To, I'm trying to, to tiptoe between some potentially political uh, comments I might choose to make. Um, Mark and I. So just frown really deeply, Mark, if you don't want me to continue, if you think I can see where this is going. Um, Mark, Mark and I were privy to a conversation we've been having with um, representatives from the Ministry of Education to define particular terms with a view to funding. So it's a particular kind of policy issue. And it just really made me very aware during that conversation. Fascinating. I really enjoyed the day. 14 people in the 14 people, I think, in the room from different sectors talking definitions and it's that I think just to answer your question Turin, I think in some ways that's almost the first obstacle is making sure that when you go and talk to a policy representative or an institutional leader that they know what you mean when you say distance or flexible or open or online um there's obviously I'm, I'm running a webinar tomorrow so I'm not plugging that tomorrow but I think it's I just think it's really interesting that the the, it, it looks superficially very straightforward, but in reality, you first have to establish what the person you're talking to is is hearing before you go too far down the road. I think I think that's the first challenge. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree with you. And why am I talking about open, flexible distance, OFDL all the time? It's like trying, you know, to capture the diversity because these terms are also used differently in different parts of the world. So when we are a, a global association like ICDE, uh, we are all the time trying to take into account the various ways that these terms are being used. Uh, but as you say, with the stakeholders we are targeting, we don't know uh, what they know about our fields. So uh, if it's a, a ministry or, you know, someone, decision makers out there, um, really to make sure that we understand what we're talking about and the difference between emergency remote teaching and pedagogically designed online distance learning, it's, it's not... Um, it's not at all, you, you cannot know, all know that, that they are aware of this, uh, these differences. So I, I completely agree with you. This is a, a, major, a major challenge. Matt. 
Thanks, and thanks, Simon, for introducing that. Um, in New Zealand, Toran, as, as you're aware, we're setting up Te Pukinga, um, a large New Zealand poly, polytechnic, of which Open Polytechnic is now a business division. And accompanying that as part of the reform of vocational education here in New Zealand, they're looking at the uh, unified funding system. And as a part of that, uh, the, the panel that both Sana and I were a part of was looking at the definition of extramural or online. And as you said, it's as if it's just one thing. But we know from um, sharing practice across the Tipu Kinga network, there are many different types of flexible learning out there. There are many different types of extramural. Um, some of the models are just starting to stand up on their feet now. And they're being funded as if they are just one thing. So that's hugely problematic for us, especially when we consider that ODFL is actually the growth end of educational provision at the moment. And a lot of innovation is still taking place in that area. So I think there's a really strong call for us to advocate for some more awareness as to what the potential here is, uh, but also uh, the fact that if it's underfunded, it will underdevelop. And I think uh, a bit more imagination needs to be put in play to help um, really advocate and, and help grow this particular strand of education, which is still taking shape. Yeah, interesting. And I think it's interesting how I, I talk with members in all the, the parts of the world that many of the challenges are the same. So with the, with the Latin America task force that we're working with now with our Brazilian members, um, they also see the same, uh, many of the same challenges. So um, it's about um, acknowledging, uh, you know, the differences between these different models and how they would work and what target groups they are reading, uh, re uh, trying to reach, and also the, the problem with underfunding. And they see that combining these two, they see that we need to provide, you know, proof of what works. So they're really focusing on research, uh, collecting uh, research from the region. And uh, the idea is that the advocacy campaign should support, you know, uh, a, a clearer, uh, more simpler um, um, conveying, like message building messages, building on the research to convince um, the decision makers uh, exactly on funding, why they should be funding these models for education and how they work. So, so they have built two research projects as a, as a starting point for the, the whole advocacy campaign. And thanks for sharing links in the chat. I think that's also very helpful for any, anyone who will watch this also the recording maybe later um, for the for the discussion. But what what are the um, can you see any challenges? We've discussed this a little already with with Jay uh, and I think also with uh, the working groups we had um, during the ICD's Global Presidents Forum from the Oceania region. Uh, are there any particular challenges or potential that that you see uh, from your end, apart from what you already mentioned, uh, Mark? At least something I recall uh, being mentioned from these um, uh, working groups that we had was uh, it was dur during COVID, so maybe it was uh, you know colored by that, but it was the vulner vulnerability of other crises. Like okay, now we have a pandemic, but you know next time it could be flooding or uh, tropical storms, or that that is something that you need to take into account in the region. Uh, that's easy to forget, uh, and exactly this robustness of open flexible distance learning provisions that you need to be prepared. You need to have the systems and the capacity and the tools um, and the leadership you know, to be able to sustain um, these flexible learning modes. It's not only that every time there's a crisis, then you have to step up and put everything online. So is that something you, you that resonates with what have you seen? Yeah. I think so. You don't know if you like. Oh, thanks, Jay. I, I think we, we did uh, pivot into uh, COVID reasonably well across the, the sectors in New Zealand, but there was always a sense of when will we get back to normal? And I, I think sadly, that's been a lot of the focus here. I don't think there's uh, so much an interest in a robust, enduring education system that can uh, respond quickly to, to um, incidences such as COVID. It's more a case of how do we quickly emergency respond and then get back to the way things normally are. I think the exception, though, were, were those institutions who are already really deeply um, engaged with ODFL. 
uh, at Open Polytechnic, we, we barely skipped a beat. I think the biggest challenge we faced was um, coming up with alternatives for face-to-face -face exams, which we were able to do fairly quickly. Uh, but I, I think that whole sense of what is normal for education uh, does need a bit of a challenge. I, I think our normal model of education is very unsustainable and very unreliable in times of uh, pandemic or emergency. Yeah, I was going to say similar, Mark. Oh, I think the pandemic's been really good and really bad, um, you know, for, for the whole sector, really. Um, but I also support Mark's earlier point. I, I think the first piece of work we need to do is the definitions um, and be really clear about what those are. I mean, albeit that they may differ in different circumstances and different contexts, but as a starting point for any advocacy is that, uh, that we're clear about what those definitions are, what we are talking about and what we're not talking about. Um, but I also think, you know, I think we're probably all of us here are battling the, 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 the sort of snapback discussions that we continue to hear in, in most of the places we work. Um, and there are exceptions uh, to that, of course, as, as Mike said, the, the, the ones that have been doing this particularly well for long periods of time, perhaps. Um, but for the university where I work and, and a lot of the sort of sandstone universities, um, the constant conversation is, you know, we've done it, we've survived, and now let's get everyone back on campus and everything will go back to normal. And of course, you know, what we're seeing, of course, is the students aren't coming back on campus. I mean, we're constant um, discussions on campus about why the students aren't coming back on campus. And of course, the, the students as well have realised that they don't need to come back on campus for learning to occur. I mean, it's taken that amount of time or that sort of catastrophe, if you like, if you like for, uh, for them to know. We've still got some education to do with the educators. Um, so I think that's a piece um, that we could really focus on is the education for the educators that, are, that learning occurs um, much more broadly than, than simply on campus in, in the classroom um, with a teacher standing in front of the room. And so we could break the back of some of those sort of long-standing myths, if you like. Not that it can't occur in those environments, but it doesn't mean that it does. And it doesn't mean that it can't occur in other environments as well. So. Um, I think there's something about the snapping back uh, that we, we that we need to go back to the way it was before, and also something about uh, the changing role of the educator. Um, and what does that mean in distance education? Thank you, Jay. And maybe at the same time, we may want to think about um, what's the purpose of um, having the students coming back to the campus. Um, and we all know, like we all have been the students before, and is the purpose coming to the campus is actually for learning. Um, maybe that is something that we can all um, ponder as well. Um, Bettina. Thank you, Kwan Nui. Um, Torun, you're a, I work at the University of Auckland, so I'm also, we are not a sandstone university, but we are one of the, the older universities in New Zealand. And I think what Jay just said would really resonate in that space as well. There's a real tension um, between staff who would like to go further to, to, to support the flexibility and understand because they enjoy the flexibility. There's a leadership team who has now committed to more flexibility, but it needs to work throughout the whole organization. And that's a big thing in an organization that for decades has maintained it's a campus-based university. And it still says that, but the flexibility ID is there in the strategic plan that will take us throughout the next 10, 15 years. So there's a real tension. Jay mentioned the educators as well. I know I work in a, in a space where um, I hear a lot about the concerns that they have they want to see more of this how flexible learning works in that space they want more exemplars they are not necessarily interested in hearing try this they want to know how it works and i think that is also a space where we need to do a lot more work in having um yeah kind of exemplars case studies where educators can see this is what it can mean. This is what it can look like. This is what it can do for students. And this is what it would mean for me. Because at the moment, there seems to be still in the background, although it was said many times, this was you know uh, emergency learning and teaching. 
there's a big difference. There's still a big fear of what that means, especially for their workload. We also don't have a workload model that recognizes what, for example, a properly resourced course with an online component or fully online would mean. So there's, there's several things here that need a lot of attention, I feel. Thank you, Bettina. Yeah, I think um, someone put in the chat and said flexible on purpose or a flexibility within um, a duration, I suppose. Um, and there was a deadline for the flexibility. Um, Mutuata. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say, yeah, I do agree largely with the whole question of advocacy because one of the biggest risks that we have had or we've seen uh, in the last few years is the fact that uh, the very, very conservative uh, leaders have not found sufficient value in, uh, in distance education. Uh, in Australia, for example, there are about four or five universities that have uh, put a lot of stress on, well, they have, they're kind of traditionally known as um, uh, the, the stronger uh, campuses, the stronger universities that use uh, open and distance learning. And uh, when the pandemic struck, uh, they did not skip a bit, they just carried on. But the other traditional or conservative uh, universities uh, found it uh, you know, very, very challenging uh, to adopt an, this new model of uh, teaching. Uh, but the point to make then is that um, one of the tasks that we have is uh, to continue with this advocacy. So I do agree that uh, the, the advocacy is a very strong thing that uh, we need to get into and uh, take this for the long haul because we're going to be uh, we're going to be doing this for a long, long time. And the, the whole idea of postcards that uh, has presented by Torun there uh, is very, very important, and um, I found that as a very, very powerful tool. So the, the, the point I want to talk about here is persistence and uh, educating our colleagues uh, who belong to the other paradigm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Motrata. Yeah, I think the notion of teaching and learning is quite long-rooted with face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, so I guess um, that conservativeness come back. Simon, I did see your hand. Sorry, I just thought I would yeah, go around the circle for my screen. No, 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 no one wants to hear me keep talking. Um, just picking up Torin's question about what our challenges are. I think one of the challenges... Um, and I think it's a common one, not just in New Zealand, is that from a policy perspective, ministers and policy advisors in government are hearing almost a counter narrative as to what the results of us all going into a remote emergency teaching situation actually was. They're hearing bad news about students' mental health, uh, students' performance, particularly, I think, in the compulsory sector. So we also have to be aware that we will have to counter that message as we try and be more positive in our advocacy but we can't ignore it because it's it's what they're hearing yeah um thank you simon um christina did you have your hand up I did. Thank you, Kwang Noi. Thank you so much for your uh, for the the overview, Torun, um, of the global advocacy campaign. And um, my question is actually around um, now that so many, or pretty much all, organizations probably around the world have experienced some sort of extended remote working and of course our friends across the Tasman, especially in Melbourne, the, the longest of that in the longest lockdown. And so I'm wondering then um, what the impact either already is if those of you working in um, remote or open distance and flexible education have seen already a bigger influx of people demanding um, more flexible learning scenarios because they are, might now be more accepted because people realize, well, actually, I don't have to go to campus. Jay, earlier you said that students actually want to stay away. Um, but if there is a direct connection of people working more from home, that being more accepted, that then also universities ultimately simply have to move into that direction because that is where the demand lies. 
I think, Christina, there's something there about the value of the education that occurs on campus. And I don't mean this with any disrespect, but, you know, to go to, to drive or to commute to campus and, and, and sit in a lecture theatre for two hours, um, when that's significantly easier to watch that home uh, post the live event at two and a half times speed and you can skip and rewind and go back and watch it in your own time or you can listen to it on a tram or or the like so i think that i i hope that the, the narrative around the traditional mode of delivery or the being the lecture in the main i hope that's coming to question because it's not something that serves uh, an online or a distance uh, student particularly well um, so the, the boundaries I'm working hard at pushing where I work is around, you know, we, we're really going to apply the on-campus pedagogy to an online or a distance environment, um, then it's not going to stack up. It's, uh, so we need to rethink that. And, and, and so until we do, I think there a the lot of students are seeing that they're input. To, to your point, Christina, um, that, that, that I don't see, see, think that they see that there's a great deal of value in commuting to campus because they've realised that they can learn at home uh, much, perhaps much more easier than they thought they had. And mindful of the fact that a lot of their university students, particularly in first year, that then, you know, were at school with teachers and then high school with teachers in a room, that's the education model. And then suddenly uh, the pandemic comes in their first year or second year at uni and they had had that experience throughout their entire education. Suddenly, as I said, that I believe a lot of them have realised that they can learn, you know, quite well by themselves, and uh, that, that that they can manage that particularly well. And so, I think the model's got to shift, um, and I think that would then facilitate um, students returning to campus if that's a goal. But uh, but uh, I think the flexibility has to be the goal. I mean, we have a we have a thing at La Trobe called Study Flex, which um has been in place for, for a number of years which always amuses me because it basically means that a that a student can uh, an on-campus student can choose a distance or an online subject at any point in the semester so so at the beginning of the semester they enroll in four subjects they can select one of those to be managed uh the entire subject at a, di at a distance or online and I go, okay, well, that's a minute amount of flexibility, isn't it, really? So one of the four subjects could be taken in a distance mode, not each week or not at each class. So that would be really flexible. If you could wake up on Monday morning and go, actually, I don't want to go to class today, and there is no disruption pedagogically, um, that, would, that would be flexible. And that would bring the sort of equaling of the, the pedagogical approach and it would enhance the distance learning offering because then the distance learning students would not be disadvantaged by getting the secondhand version of the on-campus version of the pedagogy. You know, the argument I always say is they, you know, recorded lectures works really well, um, but it's not the online pedagogy. And why should the online and distance students be uh, subjected to the you know, the non-fit for purpose. The lecture was designed for the on-campus students. What's the equivalent that should be designed for the online students? Um, given that they're paying the same amount of money, unless we're going to sell it cheaply and say the online version is the, the, the cut down cheap version, unless we're going to do that, then we, we need to treat it in, in, in its as a separate entity uh, and consider it pedagogically. And that, I think that then starts to enhance distance learning as a genuine contender and rather than the poor cousin of the of the classroom based because th that conversation i can't really tolerate um, and worked really hard at uh, dispelling those myths the poor the online the distance one is not the poor cousin it's just different and i think what the pandemic showed in a lot of instances is that difference doesn't mean poor or, or insufficient thank you jay um mark yeah, thanks. I think we're in danger of bleeding into Simon's session tomorrow on, on modes of, of learning and definitions. But I think it's really important because um, th there is an overall trend toward more blended, flexible, open distance learning, however you want to put it. And I don't think that trend is going to go away. I mean, society has shifted tremendously in terms of its expectations of flexibility and the empowered consumer. And if anything, universities are well behind that curve. I don't think it'll be long though before uh, flexible access is just required. It's just a, a normal part of doing things. 
But already um, in, in New Zealand, we have seen, uh, there was an academic from the University of Canterbury who was appalled that students weren't attending lectures after um, COVID-19, that they were just staying at home watching them from their dorms. And the complaint was they're learning jack nothing uh, as they do that. But in actual fact, they probably are learning but also that's not necessarily what online education really is. Um, streamed and recorded lectures is not the epitome of what online education might offer. The other element to that though, is that um, the very thought of offering lectures means that you are having some sort of cohort based learning. So it's timetabled, it's scheduled. There's no need for education to reflect that. And whenever we talk about online, open distance, flexible education, I mean, do we mean cohort or not? The distinction is actually really critical in terms of how um, the education uh, takes place and the flexibility offers the learner. So online doesn't mean flexible. It could mean flexible within a cohort, but it could also mean flexible in terms of anytime access, anytime completion, anytime assessment. And I think that's where education will eventually go. The other challenge we face though is that online education is easily done, but it's also easily done badly. And unfortunately, uh, people tend to associate online education with their worst possible experience. So th th there's a lot packed in that. Uh, and I think we, we, if we are going to advocate, it's important that we're really clear as to what it is we are advocating. We're not necessarily advocating for online lectures. Uh, we could be advocating for an entirely new way of thinking about what education might consist of through uh, the best possible ODFL combination. There's a lot to unpack there, and uh, apologies for injecting such an open-ended comment there, but uh, I think it's worth uh, extending what our ambition is here in terms of what we are advocating for. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Oh, so, sorry, uh, that's why Marco's definitions are really important, and they, and they, they shouldn't be limiting uh, in, in the possibilities around what, what we could uh, advocate for um, some of those things. So, so getting that definitions as a representative of what we are proposing or what we were asking people to advocate for advocate for I think it's really important piece because they shouldn't be limiting you know in that way. Sarah? I, I would hate to claim to um, speak for some I do but I'm sure I have a strong feeling that if he were here he would say a lot of this stuff has been talked about for many, many years in the distance education world. And while of course the context is different now, those principles underlying good quality distance education apply now. And it's not as if we don't know anything, <laughs> it's there. Um, it, it's just about translating those, uh, those core principles into, into the modern setting and the demands that have been coming, that have been developing over the last few years about, as Mark just said there, you know, um, for for more online, for more hybrid, for whatever you want to name it. Um, something that I know in my job, um, I'm at a university and yes, some people say, oh, Sarah, you've got this ar archaic or this old fashioned um, uh, job because I'm in distance learning, you know, what are you calling it distance learning for? That's so old fashioned, but, I've really stood my ground so far because it's been talked about the universe, at the university to, to make a change. Maybe down the track we will, but I've had to defend, and luckily I've got people above me who have um, supported this over the last couple of years, you know, the remote, the online, let's go online. And I'm saying, but we've got a whole system in our university of distance education. Don't undermine that. Um, while it's not perfect, of course it's not, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is that the right saying? Um, there are a lot of people, and I see people here who are coming, who are at institutions with a lot of history and a lot of knowledge there. And um, it, I fear that a lot of this stuff, just as if it's not important anymore, <laughs> just cause, you know, even starting with the word online, we start with the technology, for goodness sake, it doesn't have to be online. It can still be good quality distance. Um, start there and then of course we're probably going to be using online mechanisms we're in the 21st century but it shouldn't mean that you you can't you can't um, think about other ways because if you're truly thinking about students about learning and about you know bridging that distance then um, then you're, you're using the technologies as tools to achieve those long yep. whatever 
So I'll shut up. <laughs> no, very well said, Sarah. So I think it's time to pass back to Torin. Any um, wrap up comments, remarks? Um, and thank you everyone for your input so far. Thank you. Yeah, th this was really interesting conversation, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I agree with uh, with all of you, uh, and also uh, last speaker here. That yes, we, it's something we have been discussing for ages. That's that's true. Um, but you know, new generation of leaders are gro growing up, and uh, and the the pandemic changed something. I mean, th th also someone said here that we need to acknowledge the bad examples that all also exists. So I think um, the urgency is still there. We need to advocate. We need to explain the terms. And um, exactly as you're saying, the. Um, uh, the, the what is what here that online is not necessarily flexible and so on then in order to get there to explain this that you are the expert you can do that but you need to have the attention already and you need to target the right people and find the right format so i think we have a lot of knowledge um, collectively of what works and we can tell these stories but how to frame the messages and how to build the campaign and how to reach how to how to reach the ones who are not already convinced that was actually something that also came up during the global ethics living letters campaign that okay we can stand there in the picture everyone smiling with the postcards because yeah we believe in this we we're already convinced that that is not the challenge the challenge is really to reach the ones who are not convinced or who have confused all these terms and just decided that, you know, online is so bad. We saw it during the pandemic, so let's get back to normal. Um, so the, there it's back again. So, but the 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 restructuring process that uh, Bettina was talking about that many of the traditional universities are facing, it's also something that started way beyond the pandemic. But I think to your question, uh, Christina, uh, if uh, has something changed after the pandemic? Do we do also more students and younger students require more flexibility? I don't have the statistics on this, but it's my impression that yes, they do, um, because we have um, learned to work and study and live um, and and uh, develop uh, more through diverse flexible modes and the technology during the pandemic so something changed there and it's 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 still going to change so i think really to find out what works in what purposes and back to where we started what's the point of being on campus at a university yeah there's many reasons for why the young kids should be at the university because they're going to meet friends they're going to meet maybe a future partner um it's a it's a very important forming years uh but we're going to learn throughout our lives uh every one of us uh we need to learn and develop new skills and competencies uh, uh you know until we stop working or even after that uh, so the roles that universities are facing and the demand that the politicians are laying on the universities for, for you know, the societal uh, contribution to, to lifelong learning, it's challenging because you need to develop, uh, you know, other systems competencies and, and not at least the leadership. So it's a massive challenge, I, I agree, but I think if, if, if universities are not taking up that challenge and deciding okay what are our strengths and and where should we focus this restructuring then they will lose so thank you yeah i think that was uh, and and yeah and one question also that i would like to respond to in the chat was uh, look, is, is it ofdl or odfl well this is the challenge with the acronyms and the terms back to where we started to um it's it's really no fixed answer to this. Uh, the, the, the ICD board decided to use OFDL in the strategic plan. So they chose open, flexible distance learning. Um, so I think you just uh, one need to explain the terms one are using and the acronyms one are using to the new stakeholders, because as I said, it can mean, um, yeah, it can mean different things in, in, in different regions and to different people. Thanks. It wasn't yeah. anonymous. Yes, Mark, I know. <laughs> it was a big discussion in the board. <laughs> and the board members come from different regions too. So obviously, th this is uh, with every ne new board, there's a new discussion on the, the acronym and the terms we're using for what we're talking about. Thank you very much, Torin, uh, for your uh, presentation and your um, inputs today. Very insightful. And I'm sure everyone here agrees that um, this generates a very good a meaningful discussion um, in on this um, lovely 
Monday evening here in New Zealand. Uh, and it's uh, early on your side, I know. Uh, thank you very much for um, getting out early and start the Apple Week in such a meaningful way. Um, and thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you around um, in the next four days um, for, for the Apple Week. Um, and yeah, have a lovely day and uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you again, Torren. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you all. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.